Hey, Pete, can you hear me okay? Yeah, how are you? Fine, are you fine? Good, is this Darren? This is Darren right here, and this is Pete, and uh, it's a pleasure to connect with you and talk about the new record. Now, what's the worst mispronunciation of the album title you've gotten so far? Have you gotten Patron Sky? Oh, that's good. That's, I haven't gotten that one yet. Um, you know, so the record is called Pattern Sky, and it was yeah. my wife's idea to say, she's like, you should do PTRN. Um, and I was like, okay, that's kind of cool. But I knew that people would, you would definitely get nice um, interpretations, like you're saying, or just the letters, uh, which is good, too. Well, hey, you have a reputation for being very lax, so I'm sure you'll take all that in stride. And when did you actually finish recording Pattern Sky? So let's see. Um, so just to give you a little bit of the story with it, um, mm -hmm. I, I recorded the record in my home studio. Mm -hmm. And I think I may talk a little bit in my most recent bio about it. But, I, you know, over the years of being in studios, I love recording studios and I wanted to be able to sort of record my own music by myself in the studio, ranging from bass drums. On this record, I used a bunch of drum loops. Mm -hmm. So essentially, I, I wanted to work, you know, on this record. So I guess it was sort of the fall of or maybe the summer of, of 20. No, let's see. When was it? It was almost a year ago mm -hmm. or, or even more that I began working on it. And a producer named Scott Jacoby, who, mm -hmm. who's a really great producer, he's done work. He won a Grammy for a, a record he did with Vampire Weekend. Coldplay is with, also on his resume. With, with, I mean, legit guy. Yeah. yeah. He's very legit. He actually came to my studio and helped wire it and put mm -hmm. it together in a place I wanted to be able to record anything in a moment's notice. Mm -hmm. And what I had found with me trying to learn how to do it is sometimes it would take a while to get up a, a, a microphone to record the guitar, or it would take a while to make a compressor sound good, the vocal. So mm -hmm. he, basically, he basically got me going. And then once I had created the template, with another person that I worked with over Zoom named Jess Jason Wexler, a producer and pianist. Excuse me. Um, Jason set up a template. So a template, and I work in Logic Pro. A template is essentially your all your you, you know all your um, tracks are set up. So I became much more efficient with my ideas. So and I still did this every day that I go in. And I begin working on a piece. Um, sometimes I come back to pieces that are almost sketches. And that's kind of how I made Pattern Sky. It was as if you can imagine maybe six or seven canvases laid out in an art studio. And I would go and work on each of them. And that really helped me because uh, I didn't really get bored or bogged down with one song. If mm -hmm. something were happen, I'd go to the other one. So I recorded these up to a point, and then I sent the work to Scott, and he liked it. Uh, and he said, "I'll help you sort of co-produce co the record, mm -hmm. and and then I'll mix the record." Um, and sorry, I had a little coffee here, but um, uh, no, it is still coffee o'clock over here as well. I get it. Yeah, exactly. Well, just to, just so you know, I'm in a parking lot. I just I played a gig in Portsmouth, New Hampshire last night, and on my uh -huh. way, I'm on my way home. I'm in Madison, Connecticut, at a uh, a rest stop. So I thought this be a perfect place to have our talk. Of course. Um, but yeah, b back to the story. It it at that point it became sort of a collaborative thing between me mm -hmm. and Scott, and he obviously has amazing ears and and we were able to take the songs to a place that you know that I was really or we were both very excited with uh and I hadn't made a record in a long time I have done some EPs mm -hmm. but just doing a full length a full length album 
uh, was, was something that I was really excited to to do. It sounds like there was no pressure on yourself to do this, except that you want to capture the vibes, capture what you're feeling. It was an artistic move as opposed to a deadline oriented record where they went, we have to have the first single in the deliverables by this date. Exactly. I, with, with this record, I sort of wanted to form a new team. Obviously mm -hmm. I've been part of the dispatch organization a long time, but I thought right. with my solo, with my solo work, it would be uh, important to find a new team. And my wife, Katie, is very we're both very involved not only she's involved with my work as pete francis but um our sort of art collective called dragon crest collective mm -hmm. the two of us do and i'm um, if you've seen the artwork on this record katie did the painting that is that colorful background um so that's really fun for the two of us to have this sort of collaborative we both love art love music poetry right. So it's not, you know, so that's kind of the beginning of the new team. And now I'm working with the great management team and a place to put out my record and a, and a, and a very good booking agent. And so, so yeah, so now a new team has been formed. And, and just to your point of, I didn't have one saying like, this is when it needs to be done, but right. I made it. And now we've sort of made the team around the record. Right. I find all that intriguing because somebody like yourself, and this is intended to be a compliment here, when you do Madison Square Garden like you did a few times and the highest level of stuff, I remember hearing that Dispatch was the first band to play at Red Bull Arena in New Jersey. So all kinds of distinctions like that. A lot of artists, when they reach that level, go, well, that's just the beginning. We now have to get up to MetLife Stadium. And then you have your other artists who go, that's cool that we did that. But let's now focus on the art. And for you, you're focused on the art. You're going where the love is, as opposed to trying to be commercial. Well, that, I think you raise a good point there. Um, I do. I do. I've always loved the art. And, and to be honest, I think Dispatch was was true to our art and true mm -hmm. to our songs. But the work that we did. I don't know if it was necessarily commercial but but building an audience was certainly important for us so i hope i can build an audience uh with this record mm -hmm. um but it's true i mean in the sense of i i i'm someone who's very drawn to art and to artists uh careers um but uh it doesn't mean to say that it'd be great to to land a sync with a with the film or, or, or something mm -hmm. like that. Um, but I sometimes come back to this and I think it's kind of interesting. David Brooks, who's a writer for the New York Times, he wrote a book called The Second Mountain. Mm -hmm. And I guess maybe you, you can look at the first mountain as a mountain driven by for success. And I think with Dispatch, we had this attitude that we would uh, really fight for our band and, and, you know, almost say to the naysayers who said, you know, well, you're playing wetlands now it's, you know, without a label, it'll be hard to play Roseland. And then Irving Plaza happened and then Roseland happened. So I think there was a little bit of that defying the odds that we liked and, and it was sort of goal oriented to, so to come back to the second mountain as David Brooks talks about, Maybe this is a mountain that is good for your soul. The mountain is, um, it's, it's, it could be good for your family. Um, right. And so I, I can kind of relate to that. You know, I, I'm, I really do enjoy being an artist. I'm not sure if you read, but I also got to teach a songwriting class at Middlebury College over the pandemic over Zoom. Mm -hmm. And that was really, that was really a, like a highlight of my life, to be honest. I, I, um, I love connecting with the kids. And it's kind of funny when you hear pieces of work that are sort of raw and innocent like that, there's a certain beauty that hasn't really gone through. I mean, cookie cutter may be a little harsh word, but think of all the thousands of songs that go into Spotify every day. It's, 
it's as if maybe they get a bit more manicured, you know? So yeah. my experience of seeing these kids I thought these compositions were incredibly original and, you know, they could be two minutes instrumental and then the voices and song comes in. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was really refreshing. And, and to me as an artist, or, you know, I couldn't believe that they actually called me professor Pete, but that was, uh, that of course was a highlight. Um, but really the main highlight was hearing their work, uh, and and hearing them talk about the yeah. process because it was so it was so real, right? I think that when you're a creator, you do have to bring uh, you do have to do some projects that bring you back to your roots and remind you of why you did this in the first place. And it sounds like you got that result, whether or not that was the thing that you were hoping to get out of it. So wh what I'm curious about is Dispatch is always kind of pigeonholed to being sort of a jam kind of thing even though it wasn't a jam thing sort of a college rock thing but where did it start musically with you like were you a mtv van halen kid before all that started you know i think after school in high school i'd go home and watch mysterious ways video of you two on yeah. mtv and i loved behind the music so yeah to, to be to be honest we dispatch we were so raised on the idea of having a music video and in fact my brother eric has directed a lot of music videos and it's kind of hilarious but he did the who let the dogs out video for the baja um, man wow yeah remember that and it, it's it's really a he's very talented and he did remember the jump jive and whale by brian setzer that cool yeah. video so and not many people know this, but he did Dispatch's first video for Here We Go. Um, so yeah, to, to answer your question, we were kind of of that era, but I will tell you that we really started with three acoustic guitars. Mm. None of us, Brad could not really play drums. I only, my brother, my other brother had a bass and I had messed around with it, but you know, doing the acoustic guitar thing at Middlebury, we got teased. They called us the Indigo Boys um, because, we, you know, we were strumming on the acoustic guitars and doing the harmonies. Yeah. And I think the three of us wanted to toughen up a little bit. And around that time, my brother Leif gave me that that record by the Beastie Boys, Check Your Head. Yeah. And we, well, we all really related to that record, particularly because the Beastie Boys picked up the drums bass and guitar, electric guitar and we were so kind of impressed and we thought oh that that could be us you know we could do our singing acoustic guitar and then we could do our electric set and that's really what happened and it was just sort of um what is that the the necessity of what is that of invention i always forget that phrase but it was like that was the, the necessity. So we figured out the um, Brad got better at drums. I picked up bass and Chad played guitar. And, and you uh, your sound. We were off to the races. But yeah, I didn't really think we were a jam band. I really did think that we were a band. And I thought I was proud of the songs we had. We, we did later like to jam. I don't think we were as fluid on our instruments as a band that could jam like Jerry Garcia or Fish. So I don't think we were a jam band that way. Yeah, it was it was a false pigeonholing to to say the least. It, but yeah, maybe later we jammed more, but I think we were psyched with our songs and we yeah. were psyched that with the with the vocal harmonies. So I think that's really where the music was focused. Well, Two quick questions for you, and then I'm going to let you go. And I think these might be easier questions for you. And the first one is, when somebody comes to see you live these days, what should they expect set list lies? Well, I played last night in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. And my buddy Andy, he's been playing acoustic bass, and I'm playing acoustic guitar. So I'm playing, you know, a, a few songs off of Pattern Sky. Mm -hmm. And then my, my, my catalog solo catalog is like eight or nine records. So yeah, I have a lot of music. And then of course in the dispatch territory, 
I'm playing like bullet holes, two coins, carry you, lightning, um, sort of songs like that. And then of course, maybe throw in a cover or two. So that's what my set has been. And so I, I kind of do different versions of bands. I'll do maybe a five piece band with mm -hmm. electric guitar, bass drums, keys, and a sax. And then I'll maybe do a trio. And for a lot of dates, I'm just playing with Andy, these duo acoustic. Mm -hmm. And that, those turn out to be really fun. So fans past and present will be satisfied with what you're playing. And that's great to hear. I hope so. <laughs> and the last thing I got for you has nothing to do with Pattern Sky or you or your success. It's do you have a TV recommendation to pass along a show that the wife and I should start watching? Because every time we start watching a show, we kill it in four days and we go, what's next? I know that is that is funny. Um, I mean, my wife and I watched that su show Succession, but mm -hmm. it, it, that show's pretty dark. Like the people yeah. are just they're so mean to each other. So but I do think the acting is very good. Um, so that's one show we watched. I've watched The Mandalorian with my son a lot. And I have to say that that show and that dude, Pedro Pascal, he does a, a great character. Um, so those are and then the, the other thing I watch with my son, which he makes me watch a lot. This is not a show, but it's Steph Curry highlights <laughs> of him sinking, sinking three pointers. Yeah. And now that I'm, I'm like, how the hell does anyone sink three pointers, uh, three pointers as much as that guy? Outro cast. <laughs>